Hi, I'm JP O'Brien, and um, I'm here with Fred Krawchuk. Uh, really excited to put this video together, actually, because Fred and I were talking and about these uncertain times. And Fred comes from an amazing background of over 25 years in Special Forces, um, working through and in and with uh, people in very uncertain and complex situations, environments, such as Afghanistan. Um, and when we started talking, Fred really had a, um, started giving me some frameworks on how to think through things um, that we wanted to share with you. So thank you for being here. Uh, it's my pleasure, JP. So maybe Fred, just give the viewership here just a little bit of background on you, kind of some of the highlights, I think they would appreciate that. Great. Well, appreciate everyone's time. Good to be with you. Um, yeah, like JP said, I enjoyed a career in special operations. And that did take me around the world to crew about 30, 30 different countries. Uh, so a lot of work overseas. So I think I'm sure we'll get into it, but I think part of that, what I learned there is how do you actually build partnerships, enduring partnerships with people who are different from you? In this case, me working with people from different government agencies, different countries, whether at the national level, community level. So I think that's part of what I bring to this conversation. I think another piece, I was very fortunate when I was in the military, having the chance to go to really great educational programs, you know, studying negotiations in international affairs at Harvard, for example, studying business in a business school in Spain. So I think that also just gave me some tools and like you said, frameworks to think much more comprehensively about really complex, messy problems. And then you have that analysis and how do you roll up your sleeves and work to get things done. So I, I love to, as we throw out ideas, uh, to me, I, I like to think about that the head, heart, and the hands, and how do you line it? The head doing really good, rigorous thinking about tough problems, the heart being empathetic, listening closely, asking open questions, really in the spirit of discovery to build collaborative networks, right? We can't do this on our own. And then finally, hand. It's great to have a good idea, great to have good partnerships, and it's important to, like I said before, roll up your sleeves and be ready to, to work. Uh, I, I'd like to say that collaboration, especially on tough problems, is not a spectator sport. It's, it's hands-on. So I think that alignment of, of head, heart, and hands is really important when dealing with wicked problems. Yeah. All right, well, I have a great, great framework to start off already. And I got a question about that, but I'm going to pause it because I've got three things I wanted to uh, jump into. Great. And I'm going to put that at a fourth at the end. Um, but here's, the, here's what I'm feeling right now is that the, the exponential change that we're experiencing, and truly exponential, you know, three days ago here in Colorado, we were still going on spring break with the lacrosse team. Uh, two days ago, spring break was canceled. Uh, yesterday, all the sports were postponed and now school is canceled today, right? And that's just a microcosm what's happening, not just in the US, but across the world. That's right. So the environment is rapidly changing. Um, that change can create a ton of uh, uncertainty. And not just for individuals, but for leaders. Uh, and for thinker doers. Mm -hmm. um, in these uncertain times, is there a framework where we should think about, you know, kind of priorities or how do you enter those situations? How do you teach your people and your leaders to enter those situations um, so that they can be most effective? You know, and I'm even talking about weirdness, right? It could get really weird if there's no toilet paper for, for three months. I mean, that's a joke still, but it's, but that's what it's looking like, right? So. How do we enter these uncertain times individually? Yeah, no, I think it's a really important question, JP. And I'd like to break it down in a couple different areas, okay. and then we can dive in deeper wherever you'd like to go with it. So, so, and actually we can do this in real time. So you talked about like the lacrosse spring uh, training trip getting canceled. So what, when that happened, what came up for you? Um, well, I was happy. You're happy. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, was, I didn't think it would be smart to travel down there. Great. And so what you just, uh, so I think another part of my background, something I really enjoy, and I've 
been studying and practicing uh, mindfulness for about 20 years, 20 year plus, and also the, been very fortunate to train with uh, Richard Strozzi Heckler on Aikido-based um, principles around mm -hmm. leadership, conflict management, mm -hmm. the notion of somatics, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and how you train uh, in a different kind of way to respond to stress, stressful situations. So I think the first thing that we can talk about, and like you just mentioned the, the trip and how you felt, actually your first reaction was happiness, uh, that this was a good thing that was getting canceled. So from borrowing from the mindfulness community, there's a wonderful teacher, her name's Tara Brock, B-R-A-C-H, and she has a great book out now for those folks who might be interested in learning more about her approach that I'll talk about here. But what I've learned from her, and here's a, so here's another easy thing to remember. She uses the uh, acronym RAIN, R-A-I-N. RAIN, okay. So when you're in, but so you're, you're in a tough spot or tension's rising or whatever, you get the news that the this trip was canceled or, you know, all the stuff happening on the news, you get that sort of shock. So the first piece, RAIN, R recognize just recognize take a moment pause to recognize what's happening uh, and just for you it's like oh trips canceled I actually feel good about that so I think just and, and if that's just literally taking a breath to recognize what's happening and especially what's happening to you right, right? and then the second piece is really acceptance it's not to say that you you like bad news or you like the fear, the uncertainty, or whatever you're experiencing this moment. It's just this is the current reality, and right. not try to fight it. Trip was canceled. That's that that's part of the reality. Accept that reality, yeah. And, and accept and, and really and accepting how you're experiencing that. In that mm. moment, you're happy about it. Great. Other people with all the news going on around coronavirus, uh, there probably some, a lot of us are feeling fear or anxiety or uncertainty. So we're just recognize it, not just powering through your day and accepting it like, right. oh, this is happening, this is how, no judgment, nothing, just uh, allowing that to be. And there's a very practical side of this. Uh, I had the fortune of serving with uh, General Peter Schoomaker, who was, uh, both the Army Chief of Staff at one point, as well as in charge of all of Special Operations, the Commander of Special Operations Command. I'll never forget the first time, I was a off, new officer in the unit, and he was briefing us, and he, I remember him telling, and it has stayed with me to this day, he said, man, uh, Fred, whenever you're planning a mission, plan it around the way the situation currently is. Not what you wish it was, was not not the, how it could be, but what is the current no kidding reality. Yeah. So it's another way of accepting, here's the challenge, this is the reality, here's the mission, good, bad, or indifferent, really accept that reality so that you can move towards much more clearer and effective response to yeah. what, whether that's the special ops mission, uh, soccer trip being canceled, news about coronavirus etc or the summit being canceled or there you go <laughs> i wasn't as happy about that one by the way perfect but i still had to accept it yeah so what's i what, what do i have to do next so now, now so i stand for in investigation so we're not getting too analytical analytical about it but just trying to understand okay why i'm experiencing it this way why i'm feeling it this way and so it's just to understand just having a little bit more self-awareness some people uh, when they get that, whether it's bad news or the shock to the system, so sure, to speak, yeah. some people will lean forward, right? They're ready to go into action. Other people will sort of step back, avoid it, or um, other people will more naturally uh, collaborate around the topic. Um, but it's to get curious. Why am I experiencing it this way? Oh, uh, and, and, and using the case of this, oh, I'm, I'm happy because, um, and to tell more when you heard about the, so let's do the investigation part. So 
soccer training uh, trips. So canceled. yeah, the lacrosse trip. Well, it, it was also building. Well, I mean, right? saw it coming, right? Yeah. And um, and with a daughter on the East Coast trying to get her back here with flights shutting down, and um, I didn't. I, I had already made a decision that it would be more the less prudent to get on another plane and go somewhere mm -hmm. and stay. So when it was finally canceled, that was kind of the okay, good. People are being smart. Great. So that's just a great simple example of just yep. investigating what's happening, why am I feeling this way? Yep. Um, again, in the spirit of getting clarity. So it's really introspective. It's giving yourself that chance to do that self-awareness stuff. Yeah, and yeah. to be careful that you're not beating yourself up, you're right. not blaming or um, going down that rabbit hole. Again, it's just trying okay. to be clear um, so that you're giving yourself the best information in order to make the right choice to make the next move. And that goes to N. And for, from Tara's perspective, that stands for nurture. And I look at that as making sure you, you're taking care of yourself, taking care of the situation. What is the most appropriate thing to do in, in whatever situation uh, that is? Mm. And so in your case, after you got that news, uh, accepting it investigating it what was the the next move or what what did you do to address the situation take care of yourself, well take it didn't just of... impact me right it impacted my son who didn't feel happy right <laughs> and so it was um yeah trying to i guess be there for him as he's going through it great great so there so by moving through those steps, and it doesn't have to take long, right? It could be a matter of, you know, 30 seconds, a minute. Right. I mean, is, we're not talking about hours and hours of arduous right. reflection here. Um, to have what is the most appropriate, effective response. And, and this was taking care of your son, taking care of his concerns. Because mm -hmm. you're able to do it from a more clear, balanced, centered perspective versus... Right. This happens and I'm reactive and spinning out, out of my head sort of a more unfortunate approach. So I think rain um, is, a, is a great way to uh, help us. I have another friend who's uh, got a little bit more serious situation. His girlfriend's in Milan with two kids. Um, she was not able to get out. Mm. Um, and then his brother just had a heart attack in Mexico. So he went down to visit him and at the same time his girlfriend's mom died in Arkansas Wow! and so and so now so you know it's kind of like situation piling on situation um, he's trying to get on flights he's uncertain um, as things if things escalate and hopefully they won't but if they do is there other I love this mindset things you're, you're probably gonna hit me on the head that's, that's it but <laughs> But is there other things, frameworks to think about taking care of ourselves, whether it's physically, emotionally, spiritually? Like, how do we? Sure. No, I think it's, and I'm sorry to hear about what's happening with your colleague. That sounds really rough. Um, and, and, and I do think, like, you, you know, whether it's rain or, like, these multiple hits your uh, friend is is taking it just make I mean sometimes it's literally just taking a breath mm -hmm. taking a breath and feeling your feet on the ground uh, I remember we were running an operation center we had a lot of, um, you know helicopter ma managing helicopters managing people going out on missions a very busy and some getting close to chaotic kind of environment when missions are are hopping and popping so to speak and I remember the per the person that was managing the operation center was, it was he I could tell he was stressing out, but it was going a little too far, like getting a, a little and more on the reactive side. And I literally asked, hey, let's step out of the operation center and literally go for a one minute walk. And I, as we were walking, I just uh, said to him, hey, just you know remember being on a team remember being on a mission remember when you be like on a patrol feel right now your feet on the ground mm. feel your breath notice your breath and we just walked like that for a minute and you, you see his body change the, you know the, you know his 
right color in his face again, calmer, shoulders relaxing. I just know instant instant change in his own uh, mood and, and composure. And that was, you know, 30 seconds of feeling the ground, feeling the breath, just allowing himself to settle. Back in the operations room, back, back in the action with a clearer focus. So I think it's finding those things that help you stay grounded when things get things get tough and that's very individual basis mm. I think on a very practical I mean it's not like earth shattering new information but just making sure if, if you like to go to the gym or you like to go for a run whatever those physical activities that are helpful to you to help blow off steam and just get the endorphins going um, making sure you've got that that physical piece um, happening um, whatever works for you on the mental or emotional side, whether it's, again, mindfulness, yoga, reading a good book, being in a, in, engaged in a great conversation with someone you really trust, whatever uh, helps you uh, keep your, your balance, and, we're, and we're, all, we're all different. But I just look at whether those physical components, emotional, you know, if you have a, you know, if it's, Spirituality is important to you. What, what, what you know? Whether it's yeah. going to church, prayer, whatever, uh, it supports you, uh, and making sure that in the midst of busyness and stress, that we take the time to continue to do our those practices that help us stay stay grounded. One of the things that um, has come up in our circles and in the intel that we're talking about is that it's very possible in, in some of the. Um, scenarios that we're writing out that our hospital system is going to be overloaded here in a matter of I think three days now maybe 200% mm -hmm. overloaded um, and in, from an exponential perspective that might be 400% the day after right so um, in a scenario like that like let's just I'm just I'm also diving into like the high performance side because right. a lot of these everyone on this <laughs> who's watching this is part of this community that is a thinker doer they're they're out there and they're they're probably leaders I mean for me my purpose is to you know build a community like this, and so I'm always thinking about taking care of. I've got a family. I'm a dad. I'm a husband. I'm thinking about the others around me. Um, but I'm also I'm also thinking about a scenario where I can't just rely on the normal, what I relied on yesterday, mm -hmm. right? As a matter of fact, <laughs> I'll tell you another personal story. My son, in lacrosse practice, got a big cut on his eye, um, and we were thinking like we should probably need stitches. But instead of doing that, we did it the homemade way, right? A little super glue and <laughs> some some really good uh, um, bandages. But the um, because we didn't think that going to urgent care in this time right now was the most prudent thing. Um, so I'm wondering, is there a framework? I mean, I'm sure there is, and, I, and I've read about a few. But is there a framework that you can kind of give to folks around in, when you're in the when you're in the stressful activity? Because you've just said. Hey, even in the stressful activity, give yourself a break to breathe. When you're not in a stressful activity, I, I, I know, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think that's what you're saying. Like, do the things that are gonna, you know, keep you grounded. Absolutely. In a stressful activity, when you have to act, is there like a one, two, three priority situation? I mean, I want to, and, and actually, I'm curious for me, right? Because it's sure. No, the, these are really important questions. I, I appreciate you bringing up JP. And maybe before jumping into that sort of checklist, because um, you mentioned mindset, and I, I think that's really important to make sure we cover today. Because I also think it's about, uh, like I noticed just myself somatically, like when you talk about, oh, hospital being overrun, and like, oh, okay. And I'm literally taking a breath as I'm listening to you, like, okay. Um, and so I think part of this is, is what is our mindset around these scenarios, real, imagined, etc. And what I mean about that is, um, like, just really having um, clarity, especially when tensions are rising or you're in conversation with your partner, whether it's business, family, etc. And the fear, anxiety comes up. I think. Um, just doing a quick sanity check of if you're trying to figure out something is like a 
just asking the question to yourself or your the, the group you're with, like, what are we learning right now? Uh, as a prompt of, okay, are we getting super reactive here, or, or what do we need to do? Like, just what are those questions to kind of catch yourself before yeah. we spin out of control, literally? Um, I think another good question to ask, especially when things look tough, challenging, is at literally asking, what's possible here? What's possible? Uh, I don't know if you've seen, have you ever seen the movie Red Belt? No. There's a good, it's not hard to find, you know, on Netflix or Amazon or whatever. It's a David uh, Mamey uh, film. It's about a, a Brazilian jiu-jitsu instructor. Okay. I won't go into the story. It's a fun movie, um, but there's a there. So there's a point where he's working with uh, someone that wants to become a go for his, uh, his black belt test, which is really demanding test, and they're doing some sparring, and um, this guy gets put into a chokehold, uh, and you can tell he is stressing up, tightening up, and uh, the teacher says, "There's always a way out." There's always a way out. And you see the person struggling, relax, take a breath, and find a move, right? So it's having this attitude and practicing it. Mm -hmm. When the situation's tough, there's always a way out. There's always a way out. And if you relax and are persistent, my experience is you will find a way out. So I think it's that attitude. What are we learning? What's possible? What's the way out? and be per, being uh, persistent about that. I also think it's always, always good to sometimes remind ourselves about, again, um, like as I look outside right now, and if, would you agree objectively that it is cloudy? I would. Right? So that's an assertion, that's a fact, that's right. observable, verifiable. When you see, when it, okay, it's, it's cloudy outside, what conclusion do you have about that? Uh, what does a cloudy day mean for you? Um, it means cooler because the sun can't come through. And what might that be good for in terms of activities or things oh. you like to do? Or? Um, it's not as fun to hike. So, you you so one assertion is it's cloudy outside. An assessment, taking that information and drawing conclusion is for you is this is not a good day to hike. Right. But if you said it's not a good day to hike, do I know with, that it's cloudy, sunny or not? Right. So it's this distinction. So I think sometimes, especially when it's stressful, like getting real clarity about, and I used to do this with, uh, in the special ops days, and actually now, because I do some management consulting, getting clarity from people as they're briefing me or giving me information are you giving me an assertion? Like, you've been, are you giving me facts here? Or are you giving me your opinion, your judgment, and getting clarity? Because I think sometimes we confuse those. Right. And we talk about... How do you do that? How, so, if I said to you right now, like, it's not a good day to hike, how would you get down to the facts? So I think this is one of these things about asking questions. What do you mean by that? What are you concerned about? Uh, help me understand your perspective. Really, to, and, and if I said it's cloudy outside, oh okay, so, would that be enough? Or how do you how do you know you've gotten to the fact? Yeah, I th yeah I think in this sort of straightforward example, I think yeah I, I'd have I'd have uh, we'd have enough information. Is it because you were able to observe it as well and see those that fact, if you will, and say okay? Well, I mean that would be the greatest. I mean, that would be a great case, but sometimes we don't have access to all the information, so I think part of it is, what's the level of trust? What's the level of reliability? Are you someone that I can depend on? How sincere are you? So I think that's other ways to discern, do we have good information here to, to make good decisions? So I, so I think that's part of it too. So I think another good question, if like, this is happening or, or you know whatever the situation is just asking the question what am i what am, what are we believing right now what am i believing uh, and is it true right so you know to help get down to what is true factual uh, and 
what can I do about it versus an opinion. Because a lot of it, let's be clear, a lot of what we're talking about, it's emotionally charged. Fear, uncertainty, sure. um, and thinking about, and fear is information. Mm -hmm. Uncertainty is information. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, um, so what, what can I do with that? Um, so I think it's, so bottom line here, I think it's just checking what we're believing in the moment and is it true or not? And uh, again, doing a little deeper dive so that whatever response I'm gonna take myself or with a team or with my family, we're moving from a really grounded place with the best information we have available. So if there was one thing that um, so we're kind of at this high performance piece, you, and you hit on it before, right? So, uh, so we hit on how to think about a situation, how to be, how to react, how to, I guess maybe throttle reaction uh, during an event, especially in uncertainty. We've talked about um, how to work a little bit with somebody else in that environment and, yeah. and ask questions to get down to like facts versus assertions. Um, and then you also talked about, I just want to go back to because I skipped over it, you talked a little bit about high performance. And uh, so we're not, when we're not in the, um, in the stressors, what's one thing that I should do every day for the next, you know, whatever it is, while school's out, um, to again, kind of make sure that I'm, I'm, I can perform at a high level. Great. Now, you, I, this piece, so what can you do on a daily basis, for, uh, for example, I think it's a great question. And it reminds me, we, we had a saying in, this, in, uh, in, my, in, the, in the special operations community, and it goes something like this. Um, we don't rise to the occasion. We fall to the level of our training. Meaning, especially in crisis or when the risk is high or... Um, and that is my experience. Whatever you've been practicing or whatever your habits are, that's what's gonna show up when the tension stress level is high. Mm. Uh, and so whatever we're doing day to day is, is gonna help us be ready for those moments when we really need our resources for clear thinking and effective responses. So I think in, I think in, in some ways, and it it's really depends on what you like, what makes sense, and whatever you're using now. So for example, if some people have, you know, every morning when, before they kick off their day, you know, they're writing their list of things to do, or they use a calendar, or they do a reflection at the end of the day, uh, or, or however you're, you know, or I go to the gym in the morning, whatever your current like schedule regimen is, just trying to add add to it. So for example, the things that we've already been talking about. Um, if you, uh, if, for example, every morning I start off the day with 30 minutes of, of meditation. Uh, and if I wanted to incorporate this idea of rain, so I'm already doing 30 minutes of meditation and, and last minute or at the beginning to help remind me and make it a habit, maybe I would, I could include the rain. like. Just, I'm, I'm sit down, uh, recognize what, I mean, I'm feeling sleepy, I'm feeling wide awake, whatever is happening, and then just 10 seconds of, you know, R-A-I-N. Just, so, I'm using that because that's, that's what I, that's how, that's my habit, starting off the morning, people have different, what, so whatever your, that your anchors are already in the day, um, add one of these things or I, when you're when there. you're sitting I, in the grocery yeah. store standing in line <laughs> yeah, right. just it, it, and you but you got to remind yourself practice practice it practice and what it. like I'll like oh I'm, I feel my feet on the ground I'm am I centered am I yeah. so it's 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 because we're all busy so it's yeah. just finding the things you already do yeah. and find it's like if you want to do 100, 100 push-ups you're not going to just be able to do that right you need to start with 10 every hour for whatever, how many days, and then you can get up to, to 100 eventually, right? Um, right. In a row. Yeah, so I'm a meditator too. Uh, I'm kind of new at it. I've been about five years now. Um, I agree, the practice has completely transformed the way I approach things. Um, for those that aren't doing meditation, what's the, 
what's our easiest way of right now introduce them to them? Is there a is there a book that you recommend or a video? Yeah, maybe just yeah. so to help not. Uh, I think uh, again, just to be consistent with what I've already been sharing and not uh, overload um, folks. I think uh, uh, Tara Brock, the person that I learned this rain, um, her book, uh, her latest book, um, uh, talks about some mindfulness kinds of things. Okay. I think for people who are curious, John Cabot Zinn has. Uh, very accessible books, videos, uh, uh, things you can download. Uh, Sounds True, based here in Boulder, is a great resource for different kinds of things these, that you can download. Okay. Um, reputable teachers. Uh, so, um, yeah. I mean, a lot of a lot of the us are going to be home based, right? Right. For some time. Yeah. Um, most of you are already so I think this commute saving piece it gives us some time yeah. to put something really valuable into place and, and I would recommend you know your recommendation here. and uh, I'd be, I think I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about just another couple quick take care of yourself and okay let's do that because I think a lot of it is not rocket science and, and, and obviously elite athletes will have very refined kinds of things that they can do um, and and we're not necessarily talking about that. So, you know, there's so much really good research out there. So, and, and it's a lot of, again, sort of basic, but fundamental, like making sure, you know, you're getting the rest you need, especially when things are stripped, you know, like the seven to nine hour, uh, hours of sleep every night, or whatever your sweet spot is, we, right? We can't be careful during, during high risk, high tension that we're depleting these resources. So making sure we get, we're getting adequate rest. Uh, good research about staying hydrated, especially in where, where we are, very dry kind of climate. So you know, eight to 10 glasses of water, or again, depending on what is your, the best for you, but you know, eating healthy and what, and however you, you know, define that. And, but making sure you're, you know, taking yourself uh, taking care of yourself with with that as well and um, making sure that you're again no matter how busy we are taking those breaks teach your mind another person good person to look up and for resources Philip Moffitt uh, runs Life Balance Institute and also is a long time uh, mindfulness teacher he, he taught me this notion of uh, 30, like we're taking a break. It, three seconds, 30 seconds, three minutes, 30 minutes. Just like remember the three. If it's like literally right here, right now, take a breath, fill our feet on the ground. Three seconds, just to, as a micro adjustment. Um, Jim Lauer, um, who's known for his article at Harvard Business Review, The Corporate Athlete. He talks about basically every 60 to 75 minutes or so, uh, making sure you take some kind of break to recharge. You know, getting out of your chair to take a walk. But we got to take these mini, mini breaks. And making sure we take a longer break, again, whether that's to work out, take a, a walk with your partner, being in nature. Again, whatever those things are that recharge you, rejuvenate you. Um, so just making sure you've got those micro breaks uh, um, so that you can uh, recharge. Um, and it's a sign curve, right? We're all preparing, we're executing, and then you need to recover. So, so making there's, sure we there's do kind that. of mindfulness tools, sleep, hydration, food, breaks. And move. And make move. sure we move. Whatever movement means okay. to you in terms of getting getting the body up and moving and exercising in whatever shape or form that is. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, let's shift topics. Sure. Let's move into this, uh, this opportunity, if you will. In crisis, there's always the seed of opportunity. And, um, and this community, I think, is very interested in engaging in that. Um, 
and, and not at all from like a profiteering perspective. That's not what this is about. This is about like, how do we build a better community with better leaders? How do we think about performing as a group in, in these uncertain times? And um, I'd love to, I, I read your article, and I'd love to have you talk about that a little bit in your framework and your experience around, I mean, what Fred was doing was he was in Afghanistan with, you know, military groups and religious groups and tribes and poor farmers and, you know, and everyone had different values and wants and goals. Some people wanted more power and some people wanted more money and some people just wanted to live and survive and and bringing those people together in a, in a really interesting fashion. So maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So I think making sure we're taking care of ourselves that way so that we can take care of others. And I think that's a, a good transition to that question you're talking about. So if I'm taking care of myself, trying to have, you know, have some good habits and practices, and then when I'm with my family, with my team, uh, with whatever I care about, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have that resilience available to be of service, to be able to, to be helpful. Versus adding to someone else's right. stress, uh, adding to the anxiety. So, um, so I, you know, maybe just like using our example here, right? Yeah. So both, like, so JP and I had a conversation, both concerned about what's happening, and both wanting to be of service. Why not share information? Right. Why not have this dialogue uh, in the spirit of trying to be trying to be helpful? Hey, uh, the summit. You know, coronavirus has impact on on the summit, right. and what can we do about it? So it's sort of get back on our feet. There's a way out, right? There's another great from martial arts uh, uh, traditions. Often we talk about the, uh, seven times down, eight times up. Meaning we are going to fall. We're going to have our stumbles. We are going to hit the ground, uh, and that we and that can happen a lot. And the key part is, doesn't matter how many times we're falling down, do you get up that last time? Sure. So here's the situation, right? Summit's canceled, frustrating. And let's get back up, what can we do? So you, so we had this conversation and now we're here having this dialogue, making the time and effort to share something that we hope might be of value. You were actually one of the first people I thought of when, uh, when, when this thing was coming, I'm like, man, I gotta call Fred. Because I was just, it was like, I, you know, let's do something right, right. now. Like, let's go. Yeah. 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 So I think another quick way to think about it is sense and respond. Sensing the environment, what is needed, and respond in an appropriate manner. This is, and what we're doing, I think, is a very clear, easy example um, of that. And I think in more, uh, in other kind of situations, uh, so I, what I sometimes, so I teach at a business school. And, and, and when I'm working with executives, I'll, I, sometimes I'll do this, I'll ask them, and if you want to play around with me, you can do it too. Okay. I'll ask people to put their hand in front of them. Okay. And then I'll ask the, I'll ask the question, what do you see? And, <laughs> and see, like you'll, you'll, and most people kind of laugh, well, it's kind of obvious. So what, what, do, what, what are you seeing right now, JP? Uh, what do I see? I see, I see my hand and my ring and the wrinkles and the dryness in my skin. Great. So you, you're saying what's clear, present, immediate. That's great. Yep. What else do you see? Um, beyond my hand? Yeah. So yeah, I see the room and the environment. And, um, Perfect. Yeah. That, and, and that, that is simple, but I think can be very profound. And you can put your hand down. Huh? <laughs> Thank, thanks for uh, uh, playing along with me. But that's what we, that's what all, very often happens. Very natural, that immediate concern right here, right in front of me, literally, right? And then, and you did it very well. And then taking a step back, literally, of, of checking out what else is going on. Mm -hmm. Because whether it's your hand, it's the concern, nothing is, uh, and I think that's one of, if there's any silver lining in what's going on with coronavirus, it's helping us, albeit in a very difficult way, seeing that we are interconnected, these situations are not isolated, your hand's not isolated, right? 
So you're saying you're bringing in the environment. There's a background. There's a context to the media, mm -hmm. the media problem. So I think another, especially working with teams, uh, a very easy thing to remember is this notion of when working on a complex, messy issue, whatever it is, the importance of zooming in. What is the immediate, the urgent? What do we need to tackle now? What's urgent and important? And zoom out. What's the bigger context? Who else is being impacted? Who might be partners out there that can come together to work on this immediate, uh, immediate issue? Because I'm curious uh, about some of the complexity. Like, uh, use use the analogy of maybe in Afghanistan. If sure. you can talk talk yeah. about like that scenario and how how you're able to bring those people together. Sure. No, I think those are. Um, yeah, whether it's Iraq, Afghanistan, or these tough places. Um, so, for example, when, when we were working uh, working in Iraq, um, I was there during uh, the surge period when General Dave Petraeus was there. So, the, very unfortunately, the violence levels were incredibly high. And so, we were collectively trying to figure out what can we do to change this violent cycle. And so one of the sort of invitational questions um, that I had, because part of what I was asked to do was, hey, we need to come up with more innovative approaches to what's happening here, violence on the ground. And, and I was asked to stand up a uh, joint interagency task force, which basically means inviting different diverse stakeholders to the table, whether they were coming from people that were working in development, security, uh, diplomacy, uh, civic leaders, people who are impacted by the violence, right? And so the, the question I pose to people, are you interested in having an alternative to uh, Al-Qaeda, alternative to this violence of what's happening right now? Who's interested? So literally going around, interviewing people, talking to different people, and inviting them to come work with us in this in this collaborative platform, what we were calling uh, this task force. So first was just uh, finding out what people cared about and seeing if there was consensus about the, a challenge or a problem. Mm -hmm. And then bringing, literally bringing those people to the table to and I'm looking at the artwork here, like we would literally sit around the table, semi-circle on a whiteboard and draw the picture of what was happening, what, what was the root cause of the problems on the ground and getting very different perspectives. Because mm -hmm. I'm sure you, you can imagine how a mil military person views a problem is different from someone that's uh, work, building educational programs in a high-risk environment they see the problem differently, and that's great. And so we're painting a more uh, complex and accurate picture of what's happening because we're inviting the different perspectives. Right, right. So, so we have, we've got a consensus around a challenge or a problem that we want to tackle. Now we're moving to a shared understanding of that challenge. So the picture we literally painted isn't Fred's picture, it's not JP picture, picture it's our collective yeah. understanding um, um, is this is this part of like a design think methodology i think design thinking is a wonderful way to help okay. uh, help do this uh, people that do so there's a lot of great you know, design thinking absolutely uh, systems uh, dynamics modeling okay uh, dave uh, snowden uh, is a great thinker doer based in the in the uk amazing work around complexity, mm -hmm. his approach. So yeah, there's a lot of good approaches, but it's around how to help build a more uh, complex picture. So now we have a shared understanding. And now with the shared understanding, because we have been inclusive, we have invited people. Again, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. It's not it, getting more to the accuracy of the situation. So it's not JP's truth, my truth. Right. There's some humility here about being open and curious of what's possible, what's really happening. Uh, I think, again, that mindset is really critical here. 
So now that we have a more complete picture of what's happening, that, in my experience, opens up the door. How can we move into action collectively? And because we've built some trust, and I think that's a key piece in, in these collaborative problem solving. How do we build trust along the way? Meaning, do you, do you come to the table? Do you bring information? You're not holding back, you're, you're contributing, right? And so, um, again, I, when I think about trust, it's about having people who are competent. Like you wanna make sure people are coming to the table, right. know what they're doing, they're smart, the, and a certain level of decision-making authority so that they can help make things happen. So you wanna make sure you're bring, uh, inviting competent people to the table. And we also want to invite people, uh, I think, in being up front. We're looking for people who are reliable. Like, I can count on you, the, you know. We've it's got, a culture thing almost, right? Yeah. I mean, at Black Lab, we have this these two rules. It's no assholes and give first. There you go. But it sets a tone yeah. of behavior. Right. On engagement, right? Yeah. So you have to set that. That's important. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah absolutely. Yeah, so it's wanting, inviting people to be reliable. I can depend on you. Um, you've got my back. I've got yours. Um, there's a sincerity. We're delivering. You know, if I if I say, hey, at the next meeting, I'm going to go do some research, or I'm going to go talk to my subject matter experts and bring some information. I make sure I deliver what I promise. So I think those are critical things for any leader uh, inside an organization or these more informal networks. Um, so we're building trust as we're sharing information, getting a clear understanding. So I think all those conditions and good work help us move to action and what can we do collectively. And I think um, having an appreciation for the diversity of talents, skills. Uh, one of my mentors, um, person I worked with, um, when I was doing this work, kind of this collaborative work in in, uh, in Asia, uh, General David uh, Friedovich, when we would do collaborative work um, with multiple stakeholders on, for example, the tsunami, if people remember the huge tsunami that hit Southeast Asia, uh, I think it was back in 2006, 2008, anyway, uh, it was all about bringing very diverse resources together rapidly to move into action. And I'll never, I'll never forget what, uh, 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 what David Friedovich would say is, no, none of us have all the resources, the knowledge, the relationships, the insights to tackle these complex problems. Yeah. We do, for very practical reasons, need to come together to share information, share resources, if we're really gonna have a systemic and sustainable impact on a really messy problem. So, yeah, so can I, can I ask you a question on that? Cause I'm yeah. curious on, um, so you've set the, you've gotta be curious, you go and ask people what they really care about. Yep. You find a shared desire, like in this case in Iraq, like reducing the violence. Yep. Um, you get people to come down and, and do the drawing, create the painting of, okay, here's the reality, here's the truth that we can kind of agree upon, and here's the potentials and what ifs, and how do you then, do, like, how does it work for that team to actually move into action? Great. So once you synthesize the, the situation, have a, a good understanding, then I, then I actually think uh, it, it becomes very clear what the things that need to happen, and, um, and then it, it then it, it just really organizing the effort. What's the most appropriate response uh, in this situation? And so, in some cases, the first thing to do would be more of a security military piece, where you really need to stabilize an area first, really help provide security. Maybe that was the first move that the um, that the situation required. And then, once an area was more stable, then we could bring in Iraqi, uh, you know, Iraqi agencies or other government agencies to help. Uh, once you have a little bit of stability, get a road network or rebuild the road network, for example. I mean, it's just a very simple example. Um, or in other cases, 
but what was really required up front was an engagement with the local community leaders just had this engagement this is what how we're seeing things create communication uh, right yeah. and just establish that up front uh, and so um and so i think actually the, those things be became clear what needed to get done and then with just organizing who ought to move first or how, how do we work in parallel um, to make sure that what we're doing is coordinated uh, and 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 I actually found that part to be relatively straightforward because it was pretty clear what needed to get done and who was right. best suited to address uh, what part first yeah. and maybe it was a diplomatic piece first, a community development project first. Maybe it was training a local police force mm -hmm. first. What was needed, and because you had all the right people at the table, uh, who could bring what resource to bear? It sounds like the process works. You don't have to overthink the execution. That's gonna happen. It's mm -hmm. like that's what the people, the thicker doers are good at doing. Um, if I'm reading you right, it sounds like the most important decision is the who then comes in. Mm -hmm. What's the litmus test there? How do you decide that? Again, I think part of this is you're just, you're building this network. The people who are willing, able, and interested are the ones that are showing up Got it. or so we're inviting them to show up. So you put up. a sign up basically. Yeah. And, and because, you invite people in. <laughs> right. And we're working together over time, building this level of trust and understanding of capabilities. So again, I think, because we're building these relationships and working, planning, coordinating together, we're getting to know uh, everyone's capabilities and there's a certain level of trust and folks want to solve the problem. And so again, those I think those things line up. What would you up. do if there, was, if there was two conflicting, like, um, you know, decisions or values or goals? And, and um, is it a meritocracy? And what's the decision process around, I guess, you know? I, no, it's a great question. I, and I think for, um, and, and, and of course there will be conflicts and differences and that's normal, um, not, not a deal breaker. I think what, what I found to be very helpful is to go back to the main question. What's What's the purpose of this network? What's the purpose? Why did we come together in the first place? So we have this overarching goal, overarching shared purpose that we all signed up for, or okay. we want to be there. And so I think what I found very helpful, and, and usually, so we had this shared purpose, and we would be very clear, again, in a very clear, what did we, how did we define success? What were the desired outcomes? What did they look like? What, so we had real clarity of where we were trying to go, right? And so I think when there's tension around um, execution, who should go first or how, when there's that sort of, is just to, again, take a breath and remind. Okay, I'll circle back. Take circle a break. back <laughs> of uh, what was our overarching goal? And in the spirit of that goal, um, what is the best? Mm -hmm. So, sort of, so I invite. So another thing that's important here is, and we would often say, is in, in checking your ego at the door. So again, it's about serving this overarching per mission mm -hmm. that we all believe in and want to support, and and reminding ourselves what we're trying to do. On a management consulting note, on this, and this is another approach to answering your question. Sometimes when I'm working with a, an executive team, I'll ask them, what is your, what's your mission? And what generally happens, people will come back and they'll, they'll describe their mission as, um, you know, my, I'm the VP of sales or I do marketing or I do operations. And, and of course, the, those are the roles, but then I will um, say, but is that really your mission? Uh, and we'll, so we'll have a dialogue and it will come down to, well, the discovery is everyone's mission is, it's about helping the company succeed. This, our, my, my individual mission is to help the team succeed. I've got an individual role, but again, we have an overarching uh, mission and that, that comes first. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of resources, Fred Kaufman is, uh, okay. Has got a couple of books out, uh, and he, I, I believe now he's 
chief of learning uh, at, at LinkedIn. I think he's chief of learning at Google. A superb thinker, doer, um, and he's written about this as well, um, about this, the, the power of the shared purpose, shared mission, and when there's conflict, uh, how do we best serve our mission here? Uh, and, and, and that to me is, is, has been an effective way to manage those conflicts. Well, I'm gonna start wrapping it up. Before I do, because I have one more question, anything else to, to add to that or are we in a good spot? I think just uh, maybe my, um, in terms of real practical tips on these things, like you've shared consensus on the problem, understanding, you got a collective action plan, you're moving out, find and have ways to deal with the inevitable conflicts. I think it's super helpful um, to have a system in place and how are you sharing information? And so having timelines, having uh, opportunities for people to come together whether it's virtually on the phone but doing a sanity check on a regular basis to make sure people are moving forward informal debriefings along the way how are we doing what's working well how can we improve what can we do differently to continue to find ways to raise the level of performance and have really clear systems in place to communicate updates and if changes are happening. Again, like we talked about having whatever habits are helpful to build resilience, having some structure on, you know, every Monday morning we're gonna do a check-in or every, you know, whatever that looks like so that this collective plan, busy people, it's, it's a touch point, a, 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 a touching stone where people come to, how are we doing, are we on track, what needs to, where do we need to adapt, new information, sense and respond, and so having very good flat communications uh, and a willingness to learn and give feedback and uh, as part of uh, the practice to, to really generate success and collaborative problems on really tough, tough issues. I'm looking forward to working with Simon. So yeah, let's do it. We're going to try to do this here with this group. So um, I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, and in the spirit of collaboration, JP, I appreciate that. And I'm just offered to the audience. I'm, I'm always open to conversations, working with people. Um, so this is this is how I mean, this is like, yeah, this is how it happens, right? We're having a conversation. People are coming to the table, so to speak, to check out what you and I are cooking and just to be open to possibility. So I want to practice what I'm preaching and appreciate everyone that's listening to this. Um, thank you for your time, commitment, whatever you're up to in the world and look forward to seeing you on the field. All right, so one more question to finish it up. You know, I'm big about core purpose and you just led into purpose. Can you share your purpose with us? Yeah, I think uh, my big purpose is whatever I'm, I'm, I'm very service oriented what am I doing in service to alleviate suffering? Make people's lives better. How can I make your day better? How can I make an organization better? Alleviate suffering um, and help people self-actualize. Awesome. Thanks, Red. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Appreciate it. All right, man.